Okay, all right, let's try that again. Sorry about that. Technology is great when it works. Um, so again, my name is Brenda Bowen. I'm the Information Officer with the Rocky Mountain Tech One Incident Management Team. Uh, we are here to provide you an update on the Cameron Peak Fire. Uh, current acreage, 158,300, with 56% containment. Uh, the purpose of the meeting tonight is again to provide you an update on the fire and the evacuations. So the order of presenters will be an update on the weather from incident meteorologist Aviva Braun, followed by an update from Operations Section Chief Paul DeMarico on the status of the fire activity today. We will then have Sheriff Justin Smith provide an update on the evacuations and have closing comments from Dan Dallas, our incident commander. After that, if there are any questions that you haven't had answered, uh, go ahead and put those in the Facebook chat. We do have information officers monitoring that. They will uh, either answer the questions if they can, or they will feed them to us and we'll ask them to one of the presenters tonight. So with that, I'll turn it over to Aviva. Good evening, everyone. My name is Aviva Braun. I'm an incident meteorologist serving with Rocky Mountain Type, uh, Rocky, Rocky Mountain Team. One, um, this fire, Cameron Peak. Um, I want to talk to you about what went into today, the kind of weather that happened, um, just so you understand what happened um, when we get to operations. So originally, this starting late last night, we had what started as a mountain wave event that eventually transitioned into a very strong cold front that sheared up apart that mountain wave and continued to the southwest, excuse me, uh, to the southeast from the north. So at first, we had the mountain wave event here, and then that front coming down over the fire over the course of the day. When this fire started acting up here overnight, near the CSU Ross, we actually started gusting out of the west, sorry, excuse me, out of the west-southwest, 30 to 40 miles per hour gust, 50 to 60 miles per hour. And that started at 21.30, so that's 9.30 p.m. And it continued at that level through 1.30 in the morning, 0, 0.01.30. It stayed elevated that high through 1400 today, through 2 p.m. So imagine those winds elevated that high with gusts of 60 all day long in this area. Now as the fire moved out towards the east, there is a raw station on the east side of the fire. It's called Drop Point 273 Raws. And as it moved into that area, um, we started getting a westerly wind there, 30 to 40 sustained with gusts 50 to 60 miles per hour the, um, all day. Um, and it eventually came down at 1600 to about 15 gusts to 30. So that's just a picture of why this fire ran so well on this side of the fire is because we were in that 60 gust range all day. Um, in addition to that, our relative humidities got down to about 20 to 30 percent for a half second. Um, at one point, we did get up to 50 percent uh, on the northern side of the fire at the Dead Men Ross and on the southeast corner of the Chambers Ross. But we're already back down into the 30s, um, and it, we had that really dry air that came in behind the front. If you watch the front on satellite, first off, the mountain waves provided plenty of moisture on the west side of the Medicine Bow Mountain Range. Then this front started coming through around 1200, around noon, and it sheared apart the mountain waves. It came on through, but it picked up on some of that moisture, but all that moisture stayed here. You can see it kind of backing against the mountain range and not making it out all the way over here. We did have enough moisture that we have what's called Virgo, where it'll try to rain out of the clouds, but it evaporates on the way down, and that prevented aircraft from really getting anywhere because that also uh, causes some downburst wind and some gusty winds for them to handle and a reduced visibility. So uh, that moved through. Eventually, um, along the, the front range area. I think everybody kind of noticed that we had a, a south and easterly wind. It was kind of chilly. It was felt a little moist. We had a backdoor, what's called the backdoor cold front, where it's coming in from the north and east, and it kind of came up against the foothills and didn't, wouldn't budge. And it actually 
what it did was it provided a really good southerly wind that funneled up um, the, the road that they were working on and helped fight the spread of the fire. So that worked in our favor. But basically what that front did was it undercut the front that was already moving through the fire. So that's a picture of what we dealt with today, the winds that we dealt with. Um, we did gust up to 73 at one point. Um, at Chambers Rawls over here, we gust up to 73 up here as well um, overnight during the, um, the overnight period. And we had a, a weather station down here near the Comanche Reservoir that gusted up to 76. So they had a lot to work with today, a lot of winds, a lot of challenges with the weather. Um, luckily, moving forward, we're not going to be getting gust 16, 70 for the, for the remainder of the week. But we will remain breezy as we stay between uh, a low out to the east and a ridge out to the west. And we're kind of stuck in this northwesterly flow with a lot of energy flowing through it. So we will be getting these stronger winds this week um, with no moisture really in, in the forecast. So the conditions will remain challenging, just not nearly as serious as they were today. I'll hang around for any questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you, Old America Operations. Like Geneva mentioned, with the high winds, it makes a very tough situation for our ground resources that are fighting the Cameron Peak Fire. I'm going to start on the west end. So far, as you see here in the black, it's still holding containment all the way down to the bottom end or to the east side of the fire or to the northeast side of the fire. We did get wind tested today, as Aviva had mentioned. So we did get a little, uh, we did get one spot fire up on the very northern end, just south of the communities of Crystal Lakes and Red Feather. That we engaged quickly on that spot fire, and as of right now, it is contained, and they're continuing suppression efforts to fully mop that up. We're fairly confident, we're very confident actually, that this is going to remain, the fire is going to remain where it's at, and the communities will still be, uh, will be protected in Red Feather and Crystal Lakes. As we move down, we continue to patrol and monitor all containment lines. And this is where we came up with, uh, where we had the big run today. Um, and even mentioned the winds. We also, fire is not just weather driven, it's terrain driven. And a lot of times with these canyons, winds will funnel through them. If there's even one ember or piece of heat along this line, it can ignite and we get active fairly quickly, especially when you look at 60 or 70 mile an hour winds. And that's what happened yesterday evening. And the big question is the why. You know, this piece of line has been open for quite a while. The reason that being is that's a really tough piece of ground to put any firefighters in, period, and even aerial resources, especially with the winds that we've had. With the high winds, we're not able to fly any aircraft. And that has been the case over numerous times on this incident. Um, so due, due to that, as you mentioned, the winds picked up. We got a call about midnight last night that things had, had gotten fairly active and we're getting ahead of steam. So we, our night shift, some of our data resources continued to engage the fire. Um, we were mostly successful in keeping the fire currently south of the Buckhorn 44H Road, and it has bumped County Road 27. Currently, we have fire resources scattered down from the 44H Buckhorn Road down County Road 27, all the way to County, or to, uh, I believe that's Highway 34, County Road 34. What we're doing is we have those resources spread out uh, and we're trying to keep the fire within that box. We did initiate a structure protection uh, specialist group from the EOC, and we have 64 Type 1 structure engines in route to the fire. Currently, five have arrived. We have placed those Type 1 structure engines in the communities of Glen Haven and Storm uh, Cedar Park and the retreat area uh, where they can be accessed. Now some of those areas will not uh, be able to be uh, accessed by such large engines, but we do have wildland fire engines also in some of those areas that are accessible by the bit larger trucks. Our plan for the next 24 to 48 hours is to continue our primary uh, objective of structure protection and point protection throughout the communities of uh, the retreat, Glen Haven, Storm Winter Center, Cedar Park. We're doing that. We do think that we have said we're gonna have a little bit of relief, but we still have some watch out situations in the coming days. Um, 
That being our priority, structure protection is life and property. And then next would be for us to look at how are we going to keep this in this box. So we're going to be focused on largely on most of our effort, suppression efforts along these road systems. Again, we put it, when we get out into this area here, uh, we have an issue getting folks in there and accessing that. So we're going to be continuing to look at options and alternatives in there. Um, but for the most part, it ended up at the end of the day today being much better than anticipated. Um, and right now we're feeling very confident about what we have here in the communities. And I'll be sticking around for any questions that you may have. Thank you. Good evening, Sheriff Smith. Uh, first, uh, I was advised that the sound, I guess, is a little difficult. So I don't mean to shout, but I am going to try to get closer to the camera and speak up. So hopefully it makes it easier for folks to, to hear what's going on. Uh, give you an idea as we were dealing with, with uh, structures uh, and, and getting people evacuated, etc. Uh, our crews were out all night last night because uh, we, we knew what stuff had been forecast by the weather service. We knew it was going to be an extremely difficult day. Um, because of that, a few days back, we had actually gone back and done an evacuation of all the upper buck corner, everything on 44H that had been put back in some time ago. We knew this was coming and we knew there was a strong push. So we had already evacuated the folks in that area. However, as these wind forecasts came in and we knew a steady 30 to 40 throughout the day and the forecast of 60, 70 mile an hour gusts, we knew it was gonna be an extremely difficult day. Uh, part of our, our reasoning on where we did the evacuations was based on the forecast, including winds pushing west to east and winds out of the northwest uh, pushing to the southeast. So it really broadened the area because our area of concern originally had been down the Buckhorn and going east, obviously that would continue. But as we got out to the uh, to Stove Prairie area and down the Buckhorn, it was unknown at what point it was going to go out and could it turn. Or just as importantly, uh, the potential we've talked for some time about Glen Haven and the retreat being a concern. Uh, and a lot of it's discussed how the terrain works. There's a real funnel to bring fire there. So. Uh, as we started our planning yesterday, our concern mostly uh, really dealt with all that area around Glen Haven, the retreat, even Storm Mountain. We were concerned about the potential. Uh, so last night, we'd already done some voluntary evacuations. Uh, we wanted to, to give folks a heads up. Uh, it really became uh, a, a big uh, concern for us this morning around midnight to 2 o'clock. Uh, the staff we had out that were spotting all night we're seeing that fire get extremely active much earlier than we thought. Uh, so from there, and it was mentioned also that there was the concern about a spot fire up in Red Feather. So uh, certainly we were working with them and had grave concerns that if that got out, we'd be back, you know, for the folks in Glacier and Red Feather and Crystal Lakes that just got back in. We were concerned, but I can tell you that the fire team got the resources up there to address that to so that northeast part uh, really was dealt with. We didn't have to do any evacuations, but as we came down, it became a, uh, apparent very quickly uh, that those evacuations needed to follow the Buckhorn all the way down from 44H to 27, uh, taking us uh, literally to Masonville in the beginning. And so uh, we got that done very early in the morning. At the same time, uh, there was a lot of, of, as most folks saw, that column of smoke, that was making a push to the south. And so uh, fairly early in the day, we made the decision to hit those areas, the Glen Haven, Drake, County Road 43, uh, the Retreat, uh, Dunraven Glade, many areas we recognized that potential. Uh, so we got on that. But then those concerns continued as we saw this fire, and it's obvious to anybody who's, who watched it or can see what's been drawn in, it made a lot of miles a run today. And our concern was once it got to County Road 27, uh, and certainly, and having been up there all night and all day, I saw how intense this fire was in areas. We had every reason to believe there was a strong likelihood it was going to jump 27, get up and, and uh, get into the Redstone Canyon area. So uh, we made a push to get everybody out of Redstone because if you know how that works, we've seen those fires before. They have jumped across before and then will jump a mile or two. So we got Redstone out. And then uh, we had a lot of reports of that fire moving quickly. And, and we also pulled some triggers that we truly had not expected today. And that was the ones that really got us all the way to Horse Two, all the way up to Lori at the top, and even con concerned about Risk Canyon. So uh, this was, was really almost an epic day 
for uh, doing evacuations. And again, uh, for everybody that's been moved, I know it's extremely difficult. Uh, and, and we hate to do that to you. However, there's nothing worse than the concern of losing life. And the way these winds were changing today, the ability of this thing to go any direction, that's what was tough. If it hit any of those areas strong, uh, there was gonna be structures going and if people weren't given a heads up, there was going to be loss of life. So we pulled a lot of triggers today, but um, at the end of the day, they're mostly held at County Road 27. I know there's at least one spot on the other side that's being addressed. Based on that, we're really gonna watch tonight, work with these crews as the reports come in to make determinations on, on those areas up through Risk Canyon, uh, down uh, through Lori State Park and, and up to Horsetooth. We'll really be evaluating that tomorrow and just understand if, if we see things have changed and we're confident that's been locked up, We'll be working to get folks back in as soon as possible. Um, the, the, uh, the concerns down in Glen Haven and the retreat area and Storm Mountain, I think, are still significant going into tomorrow, depending on what that fire does. So I, I don't see any, any real likelihood of those areas changing tomorrow. I don't know about that Far East part, but we're sure looking at it. And, and if conditions are such, we may move some of those back. However, I would say everything down to Masonville, we're probably going to hold for at least a few days. Uh, when folks understand what's happened to structures, uh, they really they really appreciate how dangerous this fire is. Um, just a few things because uh, we do know that we lost structures today. And, and for anybody who was impacted, you know, our heart goes out to you. Um, that structure loss actually starts uh, clear back at the top end of the fire up off Pingree Park Road. That fire ran out last night and it came through really between Lazy D and where Inca is up there. Folks know that. It's all it's on both sides of, of 44H. That's where it really ran through. It did come through the Poudre Springs area. Uh, when I got up there uh, middle of the night, structure uh, protection was, was really working at it. There were a few structures lost up there were our best estimates. We're not going to know for a little while what those are. It's an extremely dangerous area. There's down lines, a lot of trees coming down. But we will be working with, with the, uh, assess the, the uh, damage assessment teams to get them back up when that is safe. But it's much better than I expected up there. For anybody who's curious, uh, Sky Lutheran, uh, when I left midday, was still good. It worked around there. Um, for those that ask about George up at Hourglass, uh, George fought some fire on his property last night, but George is good. The Pinkery campus uh, is looking pretty good, as are the structures to the south of the Pinkery campus. However, when it came across and came up over uh, Pettig Pass, uh, it worked around some of the old black, and it cut back down. It missed the Ranger Station area, but it's back up in there. It got into Crystal Mountain. We know there's structure loss up there, but there is just no way to get back into those areas right now. Um, so when it came back down, to give you an idea, it came back out on the bottom end uh, by uh, Anaha, Anaha, excuse me, the, the, it's just by 44H, uh, uh, the road right there, and then a few miles south by Stringtown Gulch, uh, there's an area maybe a mile wide or so where it came out, and we know we lost some structures in there. There's areas in there that are very burnt. Going back a few miles, it's a little better, but there's still active fire. And I know structure protection got back in there when it was safe to do so, but understand if you're wondering what these conditions are like, uh, between the fire and the wind, there are a tremendous amount of trees that are down, very dangerous, so there's a lot of caution in there. Um, I don't know about structures on 44H. Um, I was back up in there this afternoon, and uh, certainly there's fire burning up there. It's extremely difficult and, and dangerous area to, for the team to address fire because there's not a place for lookouts, there's not safety zones, it's a trap. So sadly, uh, structures in areas like that, there's not a lot other than preparation ahead of time that can be done, but I know they were doing that work. Um, as soon as we have the ability to start putting a structure count or assessment, we will. Um, it, it, was, it was a bad day, but I will leave you with this. It could have been, and very easily could have been a lot worse. Uh, we have no reported injuries, no deaths, a lot fewer structures were impacted than we truly anticipated based on what we saw. Um, with that said, there's certainly a lot of folks that got hit. Um, we're we're going to pick her up for another day tomorrow. Uh, we welcome the new team in. There are a lot of folks that have been here and know this area and have been with us through other fires. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan Dallas.
Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, appreciate it. Appreciate it all the work with you and your folks today. So I'm Dan Dallas. I'm the incident commander for the Rocky Mountain Incident Management Team. Uh, we're a Type One team. Um, Want to be uh, as the sheriff mentioned. Um, we're actually unfortunately familiar. I know Larimer County welcomed us. This is our first day uh, with gusto and quite a bit of fireworks today. We're glad we're here to help out, but yeah, we've been here before. Um, been, of course, on the, the big fire at High Park, but uh, um, Crystal Reservoir Road, we we're here helping with the floods here in Boulder County, so we have some familiarity with uh, with the place here, and so when we, we start talking about places, we know where it's at, but it was, as mentioned, both with the weather and um, and the sheriff that we expected a very dynamic day we got it um, but when all says all is said and done we're, we're pretty appreciative of what could have been as opposed to what actually happened um, I know our hearts go out to you we're unfortunately way too used to seeing people that lose lose their residences and some of their possessions and that sort of thing. Um, and, but our hearts go out to every one of you that, that has uh, suffered that. But again, um, want to leave you with things will calm down a little, but we're expecting almost, if not as much, um, activity tomorrow and on into the next day. So we're not through this, this wave um, of activity yet and, and please bear with us as some of you are out of, a lot of you are out of your homes things like that are going on you've been displaced um, it's uncomfortable but uh, just expect a, a couple more days of kind of hard days if you would but if, if they can all end up more or less like this one then I think we're all doing well so thank you very much for your interest I'm going to keep uh, Incident Commander Dan Dallas up here. Um, one of the questions that we got is about the High Park fire, and is that helping yes. in this case? So, Dan, yeah, I will turn it back to you. Let me address that. When I saw the, the what's that? Oh, when I saw the fire perimeter, I said, "Boy, that looks really familiar over there." Um, so, what what happened with the High Park fire scar? Um, a lot of that has come back to grass. And, and young trees and brush, but that actually it, it, it's it doesn't stop the fire, but it slows it down significantly when you have a fire scar. So yes, uh, the high high park fire scar actually years later did help us in, in a way. So okay, Sheriff Smith, the next one is for you. Um, we have a lot of questions in general. Um, is there any concern east of Horse Tooth and evacuations to the west side of Fort Collins? They mentioned Bellevue, LaPorte, Estes Park has been mentioned, Loveland has been mentioned. So if you could address that bigger picture. Yeah, yes, thank you. Very good questions. Um, at this point, when we talk about the address Horse Tooth first, um, we don't have concerns at this point about it going any further east. In fact, based on the fact that this fire did almost completely get caught up to the west of County Road 27 or in that Stowe Ferry Buckhorn area, I felt a lot better. Um, throughout the day, we had a belief that was going to jump it and really be up in there. The fact that it's not, um, at this point, makes the game significantly different. However, that one spot fire could change that, and I know they've got crews uh, working up to, to get to that spot fire that's on the other side. Um, so. From there, we're really going to be addressing our need uh, to have those evacuations around Horse Tooth tomorrow, uh, the ones that we have. It's not a promise they're going to go away, but if that fire gets held, it could change that because we realize that's a tremendous area of coverage. But obviously, when you see how much was covered today, you have a good appreciation for, for why we picked that. Um, back down to Estes Park, no, at this point in time, uh, when you understand the drainage this fire is coming out of, that here 
um, where this bulwark ridge is and, and some of the other drainages, that's what would direct it down towards Glen Haven. We don't see anything right now that would push it back up to Estes Park. So for there, we're looking more down towards the Glen Haven Drake area. Um, anything can happen, however, there's no reason for us to anticipate anything different coming back to Estes Park. Um, also on that uh, other hook down here on the bottom, we got into Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, that one has, has uh, been fairly, uh, fairly quiet and I know they've made a lot of progress up there. So we don't see, that was the earlier concern with Estes Park. You know, this is, we're dealing two months, and several weeks ago was that, that park hooking down around the park. So I don't see uh, a likelihood. However, there are contingency plans. We work with the fire districts, Estes Park, the town, the police department, et cetera. So we, we've got all that. Um, was there another component of that? I don't, I think I hope they covered all those. Estes, Oh, love and Fort Collins. No, we really don't see anything that would lead us to see a fire that, that made it into uh, the cities around here. Um, that just really, really isn't showing as, as a likelihood. Keep in mind, everything that's carried this fire so far has been mostly heavy timber. Um, and when you get out and you start getting to uh, the, the side of Fort Collins, you're, you know, before that, you've got Horse Tooth Reservoir, which is a huge block. You start running out of the kind of timber that it really runs in. And then for Loveland, for an example, you've got a, a significant gap. You, it, and we see nothing getting us down around Carter Lake. And the ground Carter Lake is really where you run out of that heavy fuel and you get into the grasses. And I can tell you where this fire moved through, having watched it for two months and watched a lot of it today. There are areas that burn through in that lighter fuel. Those are much easier to get a hold of. Um, if there's something that's, that's helped uh, with this fire, when it was up around Comanche, that was an area that could get back into to really to get folks. Now that it's out here, even though that's not a good area to be because of the structures, it is an easier area for these fire crews to work in. And keep in mind when you get down along County Road 27, Buckhorn, um, and Stone Prairie, you're getting into a large grassy area and lighter fuels. And so, what I see of that from my experience of working with, with experts like we've got here those aren't nearly as likely to carry a running fire that would keep moving as much. So those are the reasons we don't have a uh, concern. Do we have pretty much everything in a contingency plan? Yeah, we do. That's just the day of work. Well, you're still up there. <laughs> uh, they've also asked about Red Feather Lakes and what are the chances yes. of re-evacuation. Yes, thank you on, on Red Feather. And I, I addressed that lightly. But this morning, when they had that spot fire occur up there, a great concern, but I know they got dozers, they got crews up there. Um, however, pretty darn confident, and this was, as was mentioned, the term, this was a test day with those kind of winds. This was a real test. The fact that they really got line, they're fairly, pretty darn confident on around most of the rest of the fire um, makes me feel a lot better. And even though this was a really bad day for folks in this area, um, when this thing jumped in the beginning, you know, we were looking at fire on two completely different ends. Um, the fact that it passed this test uh, makes me feel a lot more confident. Can I tell you for sure before this fire is out that we wouldn't have some problems in North? I'm not going to tell you that, but I'm going to tell you that likelihood at this point is extremely, oh, it's extreme. It's a lot lower. Um, so at this point, the fact that it'll button up and what that does for us as a community means that those resources of about a thousand personnel a higher percentage can work this area, and they're not working here and here and here and here. So I think that's going to help us in this area as it comes through. So when you get up there to uh, to a, a red feather in that, definitely today show that they've got good line up there. One more, and then I'll let you off the hook. <laughs> that almost sounds like a promise. I know. <laughs> uh, we've also been asked when we, when might we know more about uh, structure damage and assessments. A very good question. Um, because of where these structures are, um, these aren't ones that we can get to quickly because they're a very active fire area. And, and I'll, I'll uh, maybe give you a little explanation. When we had uh, structures along the Cooter Canyon uh, on that push over Labor Day, we were able to get back, obviously, the IRAP of Cooter Canyon very easily. We had an idea what was up there. Uh, we had a, a little uh, more difficult time um, uh, when it got up on the other edge of the fire up here. Um, and that, that one took several days to get to. I'm going to tell you, I'm looking at days ahead, I believe, before.
where we're going to be able to get folks back in there uh, because there's a, these areas have not just burned through. There's a lot of fire. And even getting up places like 44H, I, I can attest, I pulled a lot of trees off the road today. Uh, that's an extreme danger. So there's a lot of trees falling down, and that's not even burn areas. That's just fall of trees. So um, it's going to be days before we get back in here and uh, can give that as soon as we safely can, we will and we will share that information, but I'll be honest, it's probably it's probably a few days, and that's assuming this fire doesn't cause more problems. One of the things I can, I can warn you about is, uh, at this point, there's enough going on back there that there's a likelihood that the places that have damage may likely have more damage in the next 24 to 48 hours because that fire is still really hot back in some of these areas. So uh, if we were to go in now and say, here's what it is, that, that can change easily overnight by tomorrow. So certainly a few days back in here. Thank you very much, Sheriff Smith. Uh, Paul, we're gonna bring you up for a couple of questions. And so we've been asked, where will the 64 engines be used? And then where are you doing structural protection? If you could talk a little more about that. Sure. So that is a, the 64 engines are not necessarily, they're assigned to us, but what, what that is is more like a compact. A lot of states have them, especially the western states. What it is is that we had an emergent need uh, for structure protection engines, and we essentially call an EOC, push a button, the state gets together.